You're watching Brockton Community Access. Mark Lindy, your host, and we are doing coverage for the September 19th preliminary election here in the City of Champions. Tonight is the Ward 4 debate with three candidates running in Ward 4. We have in, I believe this is in ballot order, Derek Barros, Tony Branch, and Susan Nicastro. Uh, we have done our scientific survey out of the baseball helmet so people could pick one, <laughs> two, and three. Um, I have two panelists with me. I have Steve Foote, the former chairman of the Brockton Democratic City Committee, who today is basically announcing that he's an unenrolled voter. Shana Barnes, who is a member of the Brockton Democratic City Committee, current city councilor at large, and aide to Congressman Stephen Lynch. So we will start uh, with the first order for the first opening statement, and I just got to get my clock here, and that would go to Susan DeCastro. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. My name is Susan DeCastro, as Mark just said. I'm honored to be here this evening. There have been a lot of changes in Ward 4 and in the city of Brockton in the 27 years of my adult life that I've lived in Brockton. I served for five years under Mayors Harrington and Balzotti on the Brockton Planning Board, and also for two years on the Brockton Zoning Board of Appeals. I've been an attorney for more than 30 years, specializing in real estate and business. I volunteer for the Brockton Garden Club, the Brockton Library Foundation, the Brockton Democratic City Committee, and most recently on the Keith Park Neighborhood Association. My first love remains the Charity Guild of Brockton. I've served for nearly 20 years on its board of directors. The Guild runs a thrift store and a food pantry where more than half of its customers are Brockton children and seniors. People having good food is enough, is a passion of mine. Ward 4 and Brockton need experienced leadership on the City Council. I believe experience, character, and integrity are key and what count most in this race. After listening to this evening's discussions, I hope you'll vote for me. Thank you. Okay, and we're going to go 110 for each of you. So next would be Tony Branch. Good evening, or whenever you're going to be watching this. My name is Bishop Tony Branch, candidate for Brockton City Council. I first want to begin by saying uh, thank you to Paul Sedensky, who sat in uh, the City Council seat since 2005. Uh, and he, his career has been astonishing to many of us and it's something that we should replicate. So thank you, Paul. Listen, I'm running for city council because you've asked me to run. Uh, I'm not going to give you a, a long speech. You know who I am. I'm a community activist committed to the work on the street that needs to be done in Ward 4. Um, but I thought about something as I was riding here today and then I actually made a stop. I brought a pot today and the pot represents a recipe, a recipe for success in our particular ward. Very quickly, when I opened the pot, I thought about what does pot mean? It means that we should be looking out for the people, it means that we should be looking for opportunities, and it means that government should be transparent. So when you're talking about the disabled, uh, those that are vulnerable in uh, Campello High Rise, we need to look out for you. When you're talking about the parents that are walking their children on Perkins Street, we need to look out for you. And when we talk about government transparency, we need to talk about measurements and what we need to do in order to benefit the lives of our Ward 4. I'm Tony Branch. You know who I am. Thank you. Okay, Derek. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for ha having me. Thank you, Mark. Shane, Mr. Foot. Uh, my name is Derek Burroughs, camp of Ward 4 City Council. I'm a lifelong Brockton resident. Um, for 24 years. Grew up in the city as a kid um, and have chose to come back and invest in the city um, after graduating college in 2016. Um, I grew up on a different side of um, the city, some of the side of the city that sometimes looked over and not um, always valued. Um, so I bring a different perspective, a new perspective different from some other candidates. Um, I bring new ideas. My campaign has been surfaced around community entrepreneurship and Education. Um, I'm MTA at Brockton High. I value education in Brockton. Um, we have a great system here, and it's a system that we need to improve and keep our students here. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy this, have a good time, and vote for Derek Barrows for a better Brockton. Thank you all. Okay, so we'll go right to the questions, and the first question is from Steve Foote. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, you'll even though you're running for the Ward 4 Council seat, most of the things you'll be voting on if you're elected are citywide issues. Um, I have a couple of questions about your ward, but I also have a lot of questions about the city at large. But I'm going to open up with a question about your ward. Uh, the Kmart Plaza down at the south side is a ghost town. What would you do as a councilor to bring some new life to this eyesore? 
Okay, and we're going to mix up the order. I'm going to rotate it the whole time, so we'll start with Derek. Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. I grew up in a time where that was, I believe, Shaw's. Um, and that plaza's been hit due to, you know, having the market basket in West Bridgewater um, taking some of its business. So there, I, I believe I've met with Rob May, I've met with some other people in the city to move some more industrial businesses that way that don't need as much eye candy, that are already well ingrained in the city. Um, that will attract new, maybe some dealerships, maybe a, um, some, some type of uh, mags or Lynch's towing, some companies that are more already ingrained in the city that don't need, you know, that kick off off to the ground. Okay, next would be Susan. The Kmart Plaza is very close to my house. Adjacent to it is another plaza that used to have the Shaws in it. Um, they are both like ghost towns, you're right. Um, as a real estate attorney, I, I, I know the lingo and I plan to um, contact the owners of both plazas to find out what their plans are. Um, I'm also aware of places where you can get democrat, in, demographic information and studies done. Um, we definitely have to put some time into filling both of those plazas. My biggest fear is that they will become housing, which is what I've heard is sometimes on the table in circumstances like this. I want these to be filled with businesses, some small and maybe some large. Unfortunately, um, national tenants have changed their focus so that they look for properties that are within a mile of, um, of, of uh, high, highways and major roads, and that's not what we have anymore. But I will work very hard. It's at the top of my priority list to fill that space. Thank you. Tony? Well, thank you for the question, Steve. I have economic development experience. Uh, with that said, with respect to the Kmart, as we know that it's not only large stores that are leaving, it's mom and pop stores that are leaving as well. But specific to the needs of Kmart, what I'm confused about, uh, you know, it is the role of the city council to vote on something, but it is the role of the administration to make sure that these sort of projects are fast tracked and get off the uh, get off, get uh, from uh, the planning stage into an actual project. It is quite simple to me. Uh, who's responsible for marketing that particular plaza and the Brockton Redevelopment Authority? Who's responsible for that? We need to hold people accountable for that. The second piece of it, what incentives have the city of Brockton given in order to make sure that we can get businesses there? My frustration with Brockton has always been we're too slow in planning. And then the second piece of it is, is that our strategic plan is too big. We need to parcel out some of this planning. Um, I think that if you looked at uh, economic tax credits within that particular plaza, we'll be able to help businesses uh, come in, make bottom line, make sure that it's feasible uh, and that it's financially stable. Did that answer your question, Steve? Yep. Okay. Next question goes to uh, Shana. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, candidates. So staying in that same vein about um, that particular area, I am not, uh, I don't know if you all are aware of, um, of the flooding issue that goes on in mm -hmm. the Kmart Plaza um, and that the city, we actually were up for some grant funding to do some water uh, studies, some water flow studies in that area through the Army Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was some sort of glitch in what was going on that made us not eligible for that money to do that study. So um, with, that in, uh, with that understanding or, or kind of finding out what's going on down there, how would you particularly address that issue? Because not only does it flood the area, it floods the homes behind it, and it floods uh, across the street, across uh, Main Street as well. So what would you do to address the particular flooding in that area? First would be Tony. I'm going to call the office of the Army engineer and have them come back and help us do a survey. I mean, so for well, me... they reject it. They rejected it. Well, so. I, but we, we, could, we have a, uh, uh, not, and as you're aware, we have a state delegation, we have a federal delegation. They can be rejected, but we got to keep pushing them. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts is not going to pay for uh, uh, the reduction of the water flow issues in there, and the city of Brockton surely is not going to pay for it. So we're going to need federal support. So for me, we have to push our federal delegation, and we have to push the uh, Army Corps of Engineers to make sure that this gets done. The city councils, well, I mean, our responsibility uh, clearly is to advocate, but some of the stuff is larger uh, and requires a true partnership, and that's what my frustration is. Why haven't we built partnerships to get things done in the city? So a, a, the prime example is what you're saying, the survey. Okay, next would be Derek. Going off of what Tony said, I agree that we need to reach out to other metropolitan cities just like Brockton 
that have de dealt with this, primarily maybe some metropolitan cities in Detroit or any state, in the, any place in the, in the U.S. that deal with the same type of issue. I'm a big advocate for not reinventing the wheel, just make the wheel you have already better. So reaching out and get, talking to the federal uh, delegation and getting them on board and just reaching out and more transparency. And I feel like a lot of our city governments kind of lacks a days ago, slow with their feet. So I would be a big advocate to hit the ground running and basically reach out to these company, these uh, organizations on a fast pace. Okay, Susan? The water table is high in that area and, and I am aware of flooding. There's flooding all over that part of Ward 4. Right. And there's also um, a stream that runs on the very edge mm -hmm. of the parking lot. Right. Um, the stream that separated the old um, auto repair place and the CVS and, and the parking lot for the Kmart Plaza. And unfortunately, it's all privately owned. So um, unless we can obtain grant monies to do right. a study either through the DEP or through the Army Corps, uh, then it behooves us to speak to the private owners to see if perhaps they would come together and work with us to try to better it. I suspect that probably paving over all of that land is part of the problem that large black top because that water has nowhere to go. Um, we, we've come a long way with stormwater management and regulations at the state level in the years since that plaza was created. So right now you have two vacant properties that stand on Ward, on uh, Main Street, excuse me, um, the old CVS and the old car, um, the Jiffy Lube place, and then you have the nearly empty um, plaza behind it. I don't want to lose the Kmart. I could see trying to work with all those owners. Thank you, candidates. Thank you. Okay. Next question is from Steve. If you're elected, as a councilor, you'd have to work a lot with the mayor. Do you know Mayor Carpenter, and how is your relationship with him? Start with Susan. Um, I don't really know Mayor Carpenter. Uh, unfortunately, um, at the beginning of his term of office, his first term of office, um, he elected to not continue my time on the planning board. And so I've never had a direct conversation with him since I've barely been to City Hall since um, my time on the planning board and the Zoning Board of Appeals ended. Um, I understand that we have several important things in common, most especially caring very much about what happens in Brockton. So I certainly would be interested, if I'm elected, to going right in after Election Day and meeting with him and beginning the process to work together to better Brockton. Thank you. Uh, next would be Tony. I have a very strong working relationship with the mayor, um, and I think that that adds value. That's a part of the conversations that people have had with me in the city of Brockton. Um, when they asked me to run for city council, they were very concerned about the lack of um, communications between the city council and the mayor's office. Uh, it looked very, very um, aggressive at times, especially on TV. With that said, he appointed me chair of the diversity, well, he appointed me to the diversity commission. Um, and uh, I've been successful in chairing that commission. And again, I maintain a strong relationship because one of the things that I try to uh, explain to people in terms of leadership is that we have to be at the table. We really have to be at the table. Having an adversarial role with the chief executive of this city makes no sense to me, and it makes no sense to the constituents in which I currently represent. Thank you. Um, Derek? Thank you. Uh, me and the mayor, we've, spoke, we've spoken quite a bit since I've got on the campaign trail. Um, We've been in contact with his office. We're doing a project now at Southfield Gardens, um, trying to connect with the Celtics and some other uh, organizations to bring a basketball hoop there. Um, and basically a place for kids to play. I was actually there just before I came here. Uh, we don't see eye to eye on everything. I must say, I'm very critical of you know, my best friend. Me and my girlfriend most of the time don't agree as well. So I'm very critical of, of anyone. Um, but I'm willing to work with him, and no matter the circumstance, at the end of the day, we are working for the greater good of the people. And if Nothing's facetious or um, with mean spirit. I'm ready to work. Thank you. Okay, next question is from Shana. Uh, okay, so um, can I do my three? Okay, I'm going to ask you guys okay. if this is okay. Right. I haven't done this before, and Shana introduced this to our debate series. Curveball. She has an individual question for each one of the three of you. Um, I asked the other three that were just on the previous debate whether they wanted to do that, and we got a yes, so she asked each one a question. We allowed follow-up from the other two as well. So it's a question to you whether you will want to do that. That's not my normal format. I like, I, I like I'm fine with anything. I like the surprise. 
Go ahead. I'm okay. fine with anything. Okay. You're on. You, you're on, Shane. Well, you, you can det determine the order. Yep, the order is going to be um, first would be Derek. Okay, Derek. Um, admittingly, don't really know a whole lot about you. I did meet you one time, uh, and I have to say I was impressed. But I have to know, besides what you just said in your opening statement, um, what is your primary motivation for wanting to represent the quadrant of the city, the South uh, Campello quadrant of the city? What is your, if, if you can pick one thing that motivates you the most, what would that be? My number one motive for running for Ward 4 City Council is for, I'm a uh, David School alum. So I've gone to school in Ward 4 up until the eighth grade. I was the first graduating class um, when it became a seventh and eighth grade. So my number one run is for, um, for the students and for you know, education because the education I received at the Davis School has stuck with me my whole life. Um, I'd say if it wasn't for Brockton Public Schools and that teacher in Ward 4 um, who lives very local um, telling me that you, know, you, can, you, can, you can do this, Derek. You don't need to you know, go down the right, wrong path as I was going. Um, which really stuck with me. So I would say that would be it. So why not run for school committee? Because uh, I want to have a more holistic approach. I don't want to narrow myself to uh, running for school committee. And I work in the school system, so I would have to essentially negate, I would feel I'd negate myself um, to a lot of their votings and their processes. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, do you want the others to answer that question as well? Um, no. Okay. We may come back to it if we have time. I okay, have so the next one is for Susan. Okay, Mr. Castro. Um, you, you and I were um, running mates uh, in the last we election for Councilor at Large two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, I have to say also I was very, very impressed with you and I really enjoyed the relationship that we got to build then and, and develop, developing it now. So I have to ask, with your initial entrance into uh, Brockton politics for the at large position, what was the change to go from at large to narrowing down the scope to just the ward? Well, there were a few reasons. And the first one was um, I, Ward 4 is my first love because I've lived there for 27 years. My husband is a lifelong Ward 4 resident. So I know the most about Ward 4 naturally. And I have to say, running for at large two years ago, I just learned so much about the city. Mm -hmm. um, so much of it good. It's a mighty city. It really is with mostly beautiful neighborhoods and terrific people. Um, I, I wondered if, and the other issue was, I wondered if there would be an opening in Ward 4, okay? And I was, I was very certain that I didn't want to run for at large unless I knew there was going to be an opening. And as luck would have it, two days after I pulled my papers to run for Ward 4, you announced your decision not to run again for at large. Oh. So I had already taken a road and I stuck with it. Thank okay, you. next question is for Tony. Yes, Mr. Branch. So I have to ask, and um, it's not a secret that you are the co-Southeastern Regional School uh, representative with right. our moderator here. Yep. So at those hearings that were also televised and have been played uh, in, in, in a lot on TV, you were asked specifically about your, uh, I guess, plans going forward mm -hmm. and if you had any kind of intention to run for any other public office at the time. And if I remember correctly, uh, your answer was no. How did we get here today as you, as a Ward 4 candidate? So that wasn't the question. So we've looked at, um, apparently you haven't looked at the video. Because I was there. Of the, because you should look at the video because that wasn't the question. The question was something around what are your plans? Would you seek re-election? And I answered I would seek re-election. I intend to seek re-election. That was, that was the question. It is true that Mark had asked, had made a comment prior to that question, but specifically what the school committee, uh, the school committee member asked was what are your future plans? And I said I absolutely would seek re-election and that is my plan. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank Next you, is for uh, Steve. Uh, now that marijuana has been uh, legalized with some restrictions, uh, would you be in favor of drug testing for elected officials and department heads? And do any of you smoke marijuana or use drugs? Okay, that goes to Tony first. Would I support department heads having marijuana tests? 
Uh, no, elected officials, elected officials, or de and department heads being tested for marijuana or illegal drugs. Absolutely not. On both the answer to both of those. And do you yourself smoke marijuana or use illegal? Never drugs? in my life have I drank uh, alcohol or smoked marijuana. Okay. Okay. Next would be Dara. I would. Oh. I have a conflict with it, on some levels because I do feel that you know. For pri in the most in the private sector, you're drug tested, you know, and I, th I'm on the fence about it, but I would lean more towards yes, because we are public officials, and therefore we should be, you know, at the utmost uh, top of our game. So I would, I would, um, before drug test for city officials. And you yourself? No, I do not. Okay, Susan. I don't smoke pot. I never have. I don't smoke anything. My parents smoked cigarettes and it totally turned me off to all of that. Now, as for testing, as for testing, I think we have to wait and see what the regulations are that come out of the State House that they've all been working so busily on um, to see whether it would be legal to test people for marijuana, especially in light of the fact that marijuana is now legal. I think the goal is that we're going to compare marijuana to alcohol. We don't do alcohol testing. Why would we do marijuana testing? Illegal drug use, that's another story. It's illegal, and that might be, un under certain circumstances, that might be totally appropriate. Okay, so the legality of it would be the issue for you? Yes, it would. Possibly. Okay, Derek, uh, so you want yeah, I 30 just seconds more. I wanted to chime in on, on her remark that, as of now, the state of Massachusetts is one of the leaders in medical marijuana. Um, so I would say that all of our decision would be based off of legislation from the state. If you, if you would be able to be drug tested with a card, and if you could be a state official with a legal card and be able to smoke marijuana. So it's a slippery slope at now, but I feel like we're moving in the right direction. We're not moving too fast as a state, and we're taking our time and really researching the effects and problems with it. Susan or Tony, do you want another 30 seconds on that? No, I, my, I'm not an attorney. I just I believe strongly that it's an illegal search. I don't think that it should be done at all. Okay, Susan? I'm fine, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, next is a question from Shana. Thank you. Um, so, I had a friend uh, whose mom recently passed away. She, they lived on Southland Terrace. And um, she caught a rare form of cancer that was very aggressive, uh, and, and it, was, it was very shocking to all of us. And in her research on her mom's cancer, she found out that the area of Southland Terrace, that circle area right mm. behind the Kmart, mm. uh, from what I understand, it used to be some kind of not really an airport, but some kind of no. transportation it was an airport. situation it was an airport. or something. Mm -hmm. So when she found that out, uh, she was actually made, uh, she tried to tell some of the, of the other neighbors. They were not made aware of that. In light of that, there have been several other cases of rare cancers, not all of them fatal, uh, and also cancers to animals. What are your pos what's your position on that particular area and that issue? Uh, was Susan first. I have heard of rare cancers uh, in different parts of Brockton. I'm also aware that our asthma rates are through the roof. Um, y you know, a, a health issue is something that I would take to the state, to the Department of Health. Mm. Um, and I would, I would certainly bring it in front of the local Board of Health to see if you could get them to chime in on it. But I think testing, I think, um, you know, investigating all of this, it's, it's a public health issue and therefore the state is the best place for it. Thank you. Okay, Tony. So uh, I'm pausing because I'm so alarmed right now that this is happening. So I'm not sure if folks haven't contacted the EPA, but someone should have contacted the EPA yes. long time ago. Um, especially where, as you know, I'm formerly in healthcare administration. I mean, we look at data all the time. If there's data, if there's statistics that's saying that this is happening. Guess what, people? It's happening. Uh, so the EPA should be get should get involved so they can start doing some sort of survey, some sort of investigation. Um, they'll, what they'll end up doing is they'll come out, they'll interview the families, and they'll ask for authorizations uh, for people's health records to really take a look at this. And of course they're going to do water and soil samples. What a lot of people don't know, there's an issue with water in Brockton as well. We have very large, well, that's another conversation, but yeah, this is something that, um, quite frankly, I'm not going to get on as a city council. I'll probably make some calls tomorrow. That's, this is alarming. Okay, Derek? Yeah, I, this is the first I've heard of the issue, but I was speaking with this with one of my constituents today that I work with, um, and I was asking her about it and asking her about how she felt about environmental issues, and mm. she said, 
you know, with the 40R growth project on Thatcher Street, uh, we were talking about how, you know, right down the street is um, junkyards, I believe an old, uh, old landfill of bringing up, you know, before we put up all these people in these very close quarters, we need to test the air. We need, we're in a metropolitan city, so we need to test before we put something in. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Follow up, go I ahead. I have two cents to add. Sure. Um, Southland Terrace is pretty close to the Hubbard Street well. Mm -hmm. And I've recently, which is at the end of Hubbard Street, between the end of it and Main Street, I've recently been doing some research on other sources of water in the city of Brockton. And speaking with someone at City Hall recently, I learned that the Hubbard Street well has wonderful water in it, but it's dangerously close to groundwater um, that emanates from the Main Street area that is high in pollutants. Mm -hmm. And so the reason it's never been pursued as a source, secondary source of water for Brockton is because of the, the concern that it would pull water from that ground, that contaminated groundwater. And that could have something to do with what has happened there because groundwater is key and what's in the groundwater and what was dumped there so many years ago. Hmm. So certainly there is information at City Hall that can be pursued. Thank you. Hey, Derek raised his hand and Tony, but I'm gonna let Tony first and then Derek. Well, I, I th one of the things that I like about what Susan has just said is that there are concerns, and I wrote this down, and this is what, again, frustrates me about our city. People know that there are issues. There's just a lack of ownership in this city of Brockton for some reason. The issue that you raise should have gone to the EPA. The issue that you're raising is quasi EPA uh, water resource. I mean, there's a lot of this going, who owns these issues? And this is what frustrates me uh, about the lack of advocacy that we sometimes experience. I'm sorry, Derek, go ahead. Go ahead, Derek. Just, just. I agree with contacting our, our you know, state government, but I believe that the problem resonates in Brockton, and I think mm -hmm. we need to address the problem here and bring it further. I don't think we should send it to an outside agency to, to analyze. I think we need to address the problem here, here in Brockton together. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Steve. Uh, if you're elected to the city council, would you vote to ignore federal law and declare Brockton a sanctuary city? Uh, that would go to Susan, uh, no, I'm sorry, that would go to Derek first. As a sanctuary city, this is also another subject. Um, I come from an immigrant family. Um, I'm the, actually the first generation Cape Verdean. Um, so I'm on the fence. I'm, I do believe that violent um, people who are not documented should not be here. Um, but I do think that we need to make that process a little bit easier and make um, Brockton a better place to live. A lot of the media shows that you know immigrants are the people committing crimes when they're the one percent, uh, less than one percent of crimes. So as regards to Sanctuary City, I'm conflicted through education and heritage. So I'm I'm in a place in the middle. So I, I, it's a very tough question for me. So you you, you can't give it a yes or no. I can't give it a yes or no. Okay. Okay. Um, Susan. Repeat the question for me, Steve, please. Would you, as a counselor, if you're elected, would you vote to ignore federal law and declare Brockton a sanctuary city? Well, my answer would be, in light of the decision that was handed down by the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts in June, in a case called Lund versus Commonwealth, we don't have to reach that decision because the SJC said that local and state authorities don't have to cooperate with ICE that it's outside their purview. And so I, I, don't, I don't think we would, ha we would have to get to that issue because the SGC has taken care of it for us at this time. Uh, what, if, uh, the, what if federal dollars were involved and federal dollars were withheld from the city because? I think we're protected by that, that decision. Okay. Okay, Tony? So you don't think it would ever come to a vote? I think we're protected by that decision. Okay, Tony? So in support of what Susan said, it's absolutely true. It's the law of the land with respect to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But with that said, it's misleading to talk about sanctuary cities, and I'm going to tell you why. I've worked with um, CSJ on this particular issue and a lot of the immigrants. My frustration is actually with the advocates. 
they, they speak of sanctuary city, but in actuality, we want people to be able to go to the police department and to report a crime and not worry about if ICE is going to be contacted. It's just we need a memorandum of understanding. The terminology of sanctuary city is political, and all it does is it sends up bells and whistles to everybody. Folks really don't want that designation. What they really want is for me to be able to say, Derek, take Derek, if he's an immigrant, he is, I'm an immigrant, we all, go to the police station, be able to report a crime, and not have the fear that I'm going to end up at Plymouth County. That's what people are asking for. And what frustrates me with advocates, and I'm saying it to them, is that you're pushing the sanctuary city issue, but you're not pushing true advocacy. Because true advocacy says that I'm going, as a caseworker, I'm going to the police station with you to make sure that you're, you're, you're isolated, that you're not going to be arrest, arrested for your immigration status. Sorry, y'all, I'm looking at the wrap-up. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Are you also? Yep, that's fine. Okay, next question is from Shana. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Nicastro, in her opening statement, mentioned something about in her years here, decades here in, in, the, in the city, uh, she's witnessed things, changes in the city. So, I wanted to ask all of you if you could just kind of uh, mention one good change that you've seen in your time here in Brockton and one bad change that you would like to, cha you would like to address if you are uh, to be elected as city councilor. Start with Tony. What I've seen good is the, the loving, caring environment that the city of Brockton has. That's a change? This, no, I, I thought she said you want to, what I see is good or, I'm sorry. No, she mentioned about changes. So oh. I wanted to say what cha what, what's one good change and what's one change that you want to address if you're elected as a city councilor. Okay, so for me, the good change that I liked was the fact that finally uh, we have a city of Brockton mayor office that is diverse. That means a lot to me because it sends a message to the rest of the municipality that that's the way we should go. Government should be truly representative. The bad thing about it is, is that there are a lot of departments that don't look like that. And because I'm on this thing about diversity, 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 and inclusiveness, I believe that the worst thing that is going on is that political power in the city of Brockton is in the hands of a few, when in actuality, uh, people of color are the majority and we're not being heard. Okay, next would be Derek. Um, for a positive, I would say I've, I've been here 24 years. Um, I can tell you when I went to school for political science six years ago, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, and just for me running and starting my can canvassy, I've seen more and more young people come out, more and more people who have felt that they were in the shadows, more and more people feel that, you know, I'm not registered to vote, but I'll register to vote because what you're saying is true. You know, a lot of people forget that voting on the presidential level, you know, sometimes doesn't always trickle down to us. So when we talk about, when I tell these people about these small issues, most people don't even know. You know, at that point, we're 45 minutes deep into the conversation. They're asking me for coffee and want me to stay over. So I say <laughs> the, the political awareness of Brockton is starting to move forward. Um, and I would like to say I'm a, a part of that, of trying to get young people to realize that this is our city. And, and a negative? Who, say that a again? negative. A bad change. Good and bad change. Oh, a bad change. I would say that um, we've had some some things going on in the city that have kind of dragged their feet a little bit. I feel like there's been pro um, some things that aren't addressed. And I've learned in my time that politics sometimes isn't always the best game, isn't always the quickest game. game. Some people think that it, it's an overnight process. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of room for improvement, and I feel like we've become more aware, but we need to move in the direction a little bit faster. Thank you. Okay. Um, it was your statement. At, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at my time. Ten minutes left. And okay. I'm looking for good and bad changes that right. I've observed since I moved here the day after my wedding in 1999. <laughs> yes. Okay. A very good change since uh, 1990 is um, the railroad. The, the railroad was reinvigorated and the commuter rail mm. came through Brockton. And Brockton's been so fortunate to have three stops within our city limits one of which, the third of which, is in Campello. And that's just been terrific for Brockton. Um, I can't say enough about it. Um, in my years of working in Boston, it enabled me to get in and out, and so many people ride it in and out of the city where you can make better wages. That's just been a wonderful boon for Brockton. Um, also, in the last couple of years, probably the last 10 years, we've had transit-oriented um, development in the downtown area. We've, we've built small, smaller places for millennials to live in, and the purpose of which is for them to hop on the train and go into the city. That's been just great for our, our evolution. 
Um, the, the negative thing that I would cite would be um, the shift in the city, and, and I think it was caused by a water ban. When I first moved to Brockton, there was no new development because of a water ban. We had a water shortage. The EPA came in. We ended up with a consent decree. I, d I think we lost our footing at that time as a forward-thinking city. Mm. I think we started uh, living off the backs of, re of residential property taxes. Um, I, I don't think we've recovered from, from that, that time, and that was a negative thing. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. Okay. Uh, Derek, you raised your hand, so I'll let you all go another 30 seconds yes. on this. Um, to go off what Susan said, when the railroad came to Brockton, um, I feel like that opened the floodgates for you know, economic value due to close proximity. We already live very close to Boston, but now we can get on the train and get to Boston in about 30 minutes. So I feel like in that case, as a negative, I feel like the city dropped the ball a little bit. Whereas, you know, it's, it's very expensive to live in Boston. So now people walk outside the commute. It's very expensive to live in Quincy. At this day and age, it's very expensive to live in Braintree. So people, we are in a great stage where young people, middle-aged couples are coming here, you know, on the backs of, you know, Brockton's economically cheap, but I don't want to stay. And I feel like those are the people that we need to get here and stay here. Thank you. 30 more seconds to each of you. My, Tony. Listen, I, I'm hearing what everybody's saying, but again, I'm on the streets with people, and when I talk to them, they speak of being forgotten. And a lot of them, and, and I, you know, I know people get on my case about, well, you're always talking about diversity, but people in this city feel forgotten. You know, I, tonight I came with CJ's button on, because I remember when CJ drowned behind the Pluff School, there was all this stuff for three, uh, three weeks, and then it got quiet. Forgotten. This is what people are frustrated about. So for me, is that if you're looking for a person that won't forget you, I'm that person. Real strict 30 seconds, go. Well, I think on the issue of diversity, I think the diversity of our city, and in Ward 4 in particular, is a great strength. Um, I, I love living in Ward 4. I've been proud to raise my children in Ward 4 because it looks like the world. And um, that's just such a positive for us. Okay, thank you. We are at the point where I got the seven minute cue, so we are at the closing statements and it is this believe it or not the scientific thing it's the same order so Susan gets uh, two minutes um, okay. is it two wait a minute seven it, minutes it's two minutes two minutes yes okay Go. Uh, in close or to close I'm grateful to Brockton community access to Mark Lindy and to Jay Miller for the opportunity to speak to voters this evening additionally I'm, I'm very grateful to Councillor Shana Barnes and to Steve Foote um, for the questions they've posed and for their interest in their time uh, preparing for this. In closing, let me emphasize my experience, training, and passion for public service in our community. As a Brockton Planning Board member, as a Brockton Zoning Board of Appeals member, as the Ward 4 Committee Chair and Secretary to the Brockton Democratic City Committee, and of course on the board of the Charity Guild. I embrace diversity and pledge to represent the interests of all of Ward 4, when I'm elected to the City Council. I know the challenge of being an underdog. I've felt this before. As a woman, I've had to fight hard to be heard, often against all odds. For my efforts on behalf of the Charity Guild, I was named a Woman of the Year by the Brockton Commi Committee on uh, Women's Issues. I believe that experience, character, and integrity are at the core of this campaign. I've lived in Ward 4 for 27 years with my husband, John Tuig who has lived here for his whole life. We have two sons, Edward and Benjamin Tuig, who are now young adults, at least they think they are. I got to know so many terrific families in the years that our children attended school and played on basketball and baseball teams in Brockton. I know how important it is to keep our children busy and safe. We have remarkable families and beautiful neighborhoods in Ward 4. Our diversity makes us strong. I know firsthand about the issues affecting Ward 4, and here's just a few. The proposed power plant, the capped landfill known as Mount Trashmore, the condition of our streets, empty commercial buildings and abandoned housing. Yes, we have serious challenges before us, but there's so much to love about Ward 4, and I'll use my experience, training, and passion to work hard to represent all of Ward 4 to make it better for all of us. Please cast your vote at, on September 19th for me, Susan Nicastro, to represent Ward 4 on the Brockton City Council, and thank you. Okay, Tony is next. So the, the, you said we have two minutes. Yes. So, you know, I have 
speech in here, I, I came out with the pot, uh, people, opportunity, and transparency, but I'm going to end this with from my heart. I want to first thank Shana, I want to thank Steve, I want to thank Mark, I want to thank the entire staff for having us. I want to also go back and thank Paul Sedinsky for his service. But this is the bottom line here, people. I don't know where everybody else has been. I'm a member of the Cape Verdean Association Board of Director, now going on five years. I'm the Vice President of Haitian Community Partners, now going on four years. You guys know I've hosted the NAACP Forum. You know that I've hosted the NAACP Breakfasts for the last three years, and you can find me on TV a lot. Why? Because I'm with the community. The community is telling me that they got issues around Perkins Street, cars flying down the street. The community is telling me that they have an issue with elderly people and are disabled, are veterans, when they're going from the Campello High Rise to the stores, they can't cross the street. The community is telling me they are tired of blight, meaning that when you do see these empty buildings, they want to know why we're not fast tracking, why we're we not building affordable housing or commercial studios, commercial condominiums, so people can utilize the space. The community is telling me that they want someone elected who's been available and is truly ex experienced. You know me, I don't have to give you a pitch. My point to you is on September 19th, you are going to make a decision that's going to impact at least, at least 20 years, 20 years in Ward 4. This is not an opportunity that we can play with. I'm Tony Branch. Thank you. Okay, and Derek. All right. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, uh, Mr. Foote. Thank you, Lindy. Um, I would like to thank you guys for just a great experience. Thank you for having me. Um, and this has just been a great experience. Um, I'm a candidate that is from Brockton, went to Brockton Public Schools. Everything about me is about Brockton. Um, and I was a kid, like I said before, a person that was on in the shadows before. So now I want to bring, in my candidacy, bring people to light with me. Um, I'm a candidate that has no special interests. My only interest is for the people. No one's, there's no backdoor deals. There's no you know, people paying me bucks to come here. I'm here as Derek Browns, candidate for War 4, um, and here to represent you. Um, on my three bases of community, entrepreneurship, and education. Um, that I think the three pillars that will bring Brockton in the right direction. Um, so on September 19th, please cast your vote for Derek Barrows, candidate for War 4 City Council, and always remember Barrows for Better. Thank you all very thank much you. for participating, and thank you for putting your name on the ballot. It takes a lot to do that, and it takes a lot of time away from family and everything else you're doing. I know that. I've been there. I'd like to thank uh, my panelists. Steve Foote and Shana Barnes for being here and volunteering your time. My staff and crew here at Brockton Community Access. And most of all, I want to urge you to reject what's happened in the past and go out and vote. Absolutely. And not have 4% or 5% or 10%. It difference. is a critical election for all the city council races, for the mayor's race, and then we'll go on to the council at large and school committee races down the road. So uh, you'll see all the candidates from all over the place on Channel 9, on Channel 12, and maybe even Channel 98 too because there's school committee races. So just make sure you go out on September 19th and do your civic duty and vote. People have fought and died for it. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.